Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we gather in a sense of celebration for the works that you are doing in our midst, for the ways in which you have cared for us, given us life and new life, how you have woken us from our slumber and brought us to a place in which we could honor and celebrate you with this time in our week that we begin in praise of you. And so, O oh Lord, as we have come to a time of worship in our hearts, enable us, make the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable before you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're coming towards the end of a sermon series called Songs of a Generation, Summer Playlist. And we've been going through each decade and identifying what was the number one top billboard charted hit for the whole decade. And we began in the 1950s. So let's see how much you remember. In the 1950s, the number one hit was Good Night Irene. Yes, Good Night Irene. 1960s was Hey Jude. 1970s was You Light Up My Life. Oh, so many people love not that song. Um, 1980s, Let's Get Physical, right? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't always easy to preach on these. Uh, 19, uh, 1990s was One Sweet Day. And now we have come to the 2000s. And, I'm, and again, I said, I hope you didn't look it up, because I want us to discover maybe together. But, but did you have a favorite band or song of the, night, of the early 2000s that was in your heart this week? A group that you thought might have reached the top? Blink-182, they did not meet the top, not for any length of time, but they were there for a little bit. There, there were others. You too. Again, they were awesome. They are awesome. Let me just rock. They are, they are awesome. I love you too, but they don't make it on the top for any length of time compared to others. Who? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yeah, you gotta wait just a little bit, you know, you know, 2010's even more. Who? Britney Spears. Britney Spears. She gets up there, but she's not, not, not topping the chart. Okay, okay, listen. I know you're tired of being wrong. Let me help you out. Now, there's actually four groups that had songs that peaked beyond 10 consecutive weeks on the top of the charts, which is phenomenal, that occurred in the 20, 2000s, from the year 2000 to the year 2009, at the end of that. And they are Destiny's Child, Eminem, Usher, and Mariah Carey, who actually had a tie for the one we're going to be talking about, she was on top of the charts for 14 consecutive weeks with We Belong Together. Do you remember that song? But we've already preached on a Mariah Carey song. And the song that we're going to focus on was actually um, had more downloads than any other song actually in iTunes history. Uh, we're going to get there. But, but, but first, the 2000s. What an era. I mean, it was a coming of into a modern technological thing. We... We enter the 2000s, and the fact that we are here means we survived Y2K. Amen? Anybody remember Y2K and the scare that everything was going to collapse and fall apart? That, that the world's numbers couldn't go from 999 to a new, you know, rotating over? And then early into the 2000s, we had 9-11, which, of course, impacted with the, the World Trade Center buildings going down and the train plane crashing into the Pentagon, it affected this community in a very dramatic way. It actually, the decade was very serious. And we were ushered into this idea of a global community in a whole new way, and one that could bring not only risk to people in other places, but risk here in a way that maybe we hadn't seen in the modern era. We saw this rise of the war on terror that in some ways we continue to be in. We saw conflict in Afghanistan, in Iraq. We anthrax scare, shoe bombers, and long lines at security gates now, and things of that sort. And so there was a weight to the decade in many ways. And whenever that's the case, the music sometimes tends to go the other way tends to be more lighthearted and easygoing and, you know, not so serious. And such is the case for our song 
of the 2000s, and I have a feeling you're going to like it. Let's hear it. Is. That song is, I got a feeling, that's why I did the pun before, right? I got a feeling by the Black Eyed Peas. Exactly. Yes. Top of the charts, 14 weeks. No song has as many iTunes downloads as that song. It is lighthearted. It is not serious. It's hard to preach on, but we're going to do it. And, you know, uh, Will I Am, one of the four members of the group, was interviewed after this song came out. And he said, listen, the whole album is a party album. It's just meant to have people enjoy and have a good time. He says, this song in particular is dedicated to all the party people throughout the world who just want to party. Well, I want to say to you today, with some caveats, Christians are party people. Can I get an amen to that? Christians are people who say, we have something to celebrate. Yeah, there's stuff going on, but we are also going to cling to the things in which we can give praise to God for, that we are people who recognize that there is a victory that surpasses all the, the battles and the scars and the wounds along the journey. We have a praise upon our lips and in our hearts that needs to be lifted, and we show up every single week for a party. Church it's a party. It may be not like going out with your college buddies kind of party, but it's still a party. Now, before I go on, let me say that I would encourage us to be the kind of party people that leave our clothes on, don't <laughs> fight when we go party, that, that have practice some kind of moderation, and are careful with how we do it. But we are a party people. That is, Christians are those who recognize that God has been gracious and loving to us, that we are grateful and thankful people because of it, and no matter what other things we are facing, we recognize there are still things to praise God for. And so, every Sunday we show up, in part to celebrate. And I hope today you have shown up, whether online or in person, to celebrate the good works of the Lord. What is it that you have to celebrate today? What reason do you have to have a celebration or a party? Anybody? You're alive, right? 1950, yeah, praise God. Been here since 1959. I can't say that. Thank you, Glass. I'm glad you have been. That there's others who can be strength for when we're weak, that there's, there's good things going on. There's lots that is not great, and yet there are some good things. In fact, Jesus consistently celebrated and had parties with his disciples. Have you noticed that in the Gospels? He got in trouble for it a lot with the, the scribes and the Pharisees and people who thought he should be more demure, less celebratory, less gathering people who were sinners. But part of what we celebrate today is that Jesus loves the sinners. Despite our sin, God still recognizes that we are a gift in the world, that we are a gift of God, and that we or something God delights in, even if God doesn't delight in all the ways that we party or all the ways in which we treat each other. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, I, I love this narrative. It's the scripture that we heard read this morning that Danielle shared. It's, it's at a place where Jesus has been walking around in ministry for a couple of years now. Earlier in his ministry, he had invited the disciples to follow him. And at some point, he says to the 12, the, the apostles, he says to them, I want you to pair off, and I'm going to send you out, and I want you to go, and I want you to proclaim my peace, my shalom, to the communities, to the world, to the people out there that need a recognition and a reminder that God is with them, and that there is something that God is gifting to them, that, that there's a celebration to be had. And he sent them out and he said, don't take with yourself an extra coat or, or staff or sandals or food or money. Just go anticipating that there's going to be something good happening. That there's a reason to praise God. God is going to reveal himself to you. And so they went 
And they come back rejoicing. And they say things like we heard in other passages, saying things like, we have seen strange things, things that we had convinced ourselves we couldn't see anymore. We've convinced ourselves that the world was dark and that there was terror everywhere and that people were mostly unkind to each other. And, and we went out there and we were confronted when we, when we chose not to present that, but we, we chose to present the peace of the Lord and the joy in the Lord. Turns out we experienced an outpouring of joy and peace from others. We had thought the world was darker than it really actually is. There is so much to celebrate. And so a year later, or maybe more, the community of faith that are, that are the followers of Jesus has grown. Now it's, it's many dozens of people. And Jesus gathers those who would go forth in his name as his ambassadors. And he says, I want you to go to the towns I'm going to be going to. And I want you to prepare in them a celebration, like the psalm we said at the beginning of the service, to make a joyful noise, to recognize God is doing something new. 72 people step forward and say, send me. Do you remember this story? And Jesus gives the same instructions as he had given to the 12. He said, don't care with you extra stuff. Go, and as you enter into a town, say, peace of the Lord be with you. And mean it in your heart. Don't be walking in with bitterness or shade or casting a sideward glance. Actually, have a heart full, ready to embody and to offer joy in the Lord. And he says, as you go and do that, if people say yes to that, then enter into their home, receive what they give you, celebrate what God is doing, and you're going to do miracles. There will be healings. It'll be like the demons are being conquered in your midst. It'll be a remarkable adventure for you. And those 70 go off in pairs, 30, 35, 36 places they go to that Jesus then later goes. And then after they've been there some time, by the way, he also says this. He says, not everywhere is going to receive you well. Don't let that get you down. Jesus says, if, if you go into a town and they're like, we don't want anything to do with you. We hate you. We don't like how you look. We don't think you should be here. You're not from here. All, if they say any of that, he says, shake it off, which is a whole different song, right? Shake it off. <laughs> shake it off. He says, just let it fall off of you. You got plenty of stuff that's trying to cling to you that you need to let go of. Let it go. Shake that off. And then he says, then go on and continue peace. Continue to offer it. Continue to offer joy. So after any an in undescribed amount of time, they come back together in Luke chapter 10, and we heard these passages. When they returned, they returned with joy. They come back together and like, it's been a party out there. You have no idea. I can't wait to share with you what happened. Isn't that the greatest kind of party? When you get together with people who you care about and you haven't seen in a while and you go, this is what's been going on. I, I can't, I want to share with you this story of what happened just the other day. And you can help each other to recognize the light and the joy and the beauty in life again. Because it's there. It's there. God has not left us. It is there. And so they come back together with joy and they're like, it was like, it was like the demons were conquered and healings took place and your power, you told us, Jesus, that you were going to give us your power. And it felt like you did. And Jesus says, look, you're rejoicing at the, uh, the awesome things you got to participate in. Rejoice also in that the Lord has included you in God's kingdom. You're part of the book of life. God has enveloped, with, enveloped you in two this part of God's plan and joy in this world. What a beautiful thing. And so what do they do next? They celebrate even more. And Jesus goes, you know, there are those who, who have minds that are more brilliant than any professor in the world. And yet sometimes God blesses us who are just like infants in our minds and helps us to come to a sense of joy. Sometimes we get in our own way, intellectually or other things. And Jesus is like, it's time to turn on, I got a feeling. <laughs> and start to just celebrate again. I don't know about you, I feel like we need this message post-COVID. Am I wrong? We need the reminder of how important it is to gather and party together. We are people who mark births with celebration, people of faith. We're people who, who mark baptisms and new birth with celebrations of faith. We're people who, who mark weddings, marriages, milestones, accomplishments, 
We even come together and remember things like 9-11, like we're going to do on the 20th anniversary here in September. Not because we're glad that the event took place, but that we were not so terrorized by it that we snuffed out, that we were consumed by it, that God has been present with us through it and continues to be in whatever it is we're in right now. And in the Methodist system, in our Methodist tradition, we even call funerals, you know what we call them? Celebrations of life. There is mourning enough to be had. It's not to say we don't recognize that. It doesn't mean we don't grieve or shed a tear. But we also gather in moments of mourning and loss, and we say, I will celebrate and praise God in this moment. It is renewing. And I'm going to remember the life i got to share with that person. So I'm going to celebrate their life. For the time with them that I had. For the experiences we got to participate in together. For the silliness and folly we participated in. And the power and the strength we had together. We remember and we celebrate. Jesus did this with his disciples. And lest we forget, Jesus is inviting us to celebrate today too. To say, it's going to be a good night. In the song, I counted, they say that 34 times in a row. In a row. It's like, in case you didn't get it. Let me just keep saying this. Why do we do this? We do this because we need to be reminded that there's something to celebrate. We also do it because we need community. When you get together with somebody and you say, this is what's happened. Let me tell you a story. You're building fellowship. The Bible calls that fellowship, kononia in the Greek. And it's a holy encounter. We celebrate with that person a sharing of life. And so I want to encourage you, even if you're still more on Zoom and <laughs> online than you are in person, to make a way, find a way, and make sure to reinstitute the celebration and remembrances back into your conversations your friendships, your marriages, your parents, your children, your co-workers' lives. To celebrate when you secure a, a deal or get a new client in your business. To celebrate, to, to not be so, so reserved as to, to not celebrate. And to make sure you also celebrate your faith. Don't mourn your faith. Celebrate your relationship with God for it's all good with God even if it's not always all good here. We praise God for we need to do that, and God does something new in our lives. I also want to invite us, as we come towards the end of this, to remember to invite God to the party. Ever had a party where you didn't want anything having to do with God in it, <laughs> or mention of God in it? You're like, you know, I just want to let loose. Look, learn to let down your hair, but do it in a way that's sustainable. <laughs> that the next day you're not going, oh, what was I thinking? Right? Apostle Paul says it this way. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He says, make sure that you're able to repeat the manner in which you let down your hair, let off some steam, and celebrate good things in your life. Because the ways we can choose to celebrate could be really life-robbing or destructive. And so get used to celebrating in a way that is sustainable. In the song, they say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day. Well, you can't do every day the same kind of party. And there's a time, you know, once a year in Passover, Exodus reminds us, where you have some wine because God gives it to us to make us glad, according to the Psalms. But carefully, not every night. And then you go, okay, I'm going to remember that special thing, how God delivered on that time. I'm going to really celebrate with others and then come back together and do it but do it in a way that you can continue to do it my favorite passage in the new testament in the in the epistles what jan calls a life verse is philippians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7 it's what she read for us this morning i love this passage and sometimes when i need a reset i repeat it in my mind and i want to encourage you to commit it to memory because I found it to be really meaningful to me to commit to memory. It says, Paul is saying, by the way, Paul's in jail when he says this. He's locked up in Rome 
imprisoned for the umpteenth time specifically because he told people Jesus was the resurrection and the life. And they locked him up for it. And he could be really bitter right now. He could be really just done with the world or with others or even with himself or with God. But he's, he's just not. And instead he says, I have so many reasons to celebrate. I, I should make sure to remember those. He helps two women in the church who are in conflict to come to some type of peace between each other. Yodia and Syncate. He says, come on, be of same mind in Christ. And then he goes on and he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. For the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my prayer for us is that we remember that we are a party people, a celebration people, a party that, can, that does invite God into it and holds God there. And, and a party people that does it in a way that is life-giving and sustaining. That last part there I had said about keeping God in the party. I've, gone, I've been invited to two weddings this summer in which there wasn't even a whisper of God in the whole wedding. And, you know, I do a lot of weddings. And I get to celebrate. And whenever I do a wedding, there's a lot of talk about God. A lot of talk about God. But I, I just, I felt like there was an absence of a celebration. It's not that I was, like, feeling like they were violating something or doing something wrong. It's just they were not opening themselves to an additional blessing, a celebration that, that their love might be born of God, might be knit together in a godly way, might be sustained by the Almighty, and that God might bless their union. We need to make sure to remember to invite God to our party. And to not forget to still be a party people. In the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.